Thank you. Thank you very much for having me with you. Um, welcome to my home office. Uh, I'm coming to you from just north of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and delighted to be with you. I am going to be sharing some of my favorite stories from working at Harvard and elsewhere. Uh, and I've put them in the style of some of my favorite stories too. So I hope you will be entertained by them. Uh, and let me just get my, uh, my screen up here. Although I know you're trying to read what books I have up here. When I was at Harvard, actually, um, so I do have my, my master's degree from Harvard University. I will say this book was one of the, um, was written by one of the professors with whom I studied, Professor Maria Tatar. I was a German languages and linguistics student. Uh, and so I got to read Brother Grimm fairy tales in their original. Uh, and let me tell you, they do not end as happily as they do in the, uh, the Americanized, well, the sanitized version of them that we tell our kids. <laughs> Uh, and which is a good segue into uh, kind of the title slide here. Um, life will never be perfect, right? So we're here to help make it work. Uh, one of the biggest uh, encouragements I give my team at Harvard is we see nothing but opportunity for improvement everywhere. Um, very oftentimes when we're asked to come in and consult on projects. Um, so I manage five people. We are all consultants to Harvard University itself. Uh, and we take on the high-risk projects. And they, they may be high-risk because of the sensitive data or the operating systems involved, just what a system could do. Maybe it's not the data. And... We find a good starting point for our questions can often be, well, what are we doing today? I know what you're proposing to me, what you want to do when we're consulting on that, but what do we do today? Uh, and when you're at a, an institution that's so old, that has a lot of legacy systems or um, still paper-based systems, very office space at times, I walk the paper down the hall to the other person. You can just say like, Oh my gosh. Okay. So whatever we can do to help you move this forward will be great. Uh, and so with my team, they know one of our mottos is nothing but opportunity. Where do you want to start today? We can only make this better everywhere. So with that, I want to share just some of my favorite stories with you. Uh, names have been changed to protect those involved. Um, we're going to call this first one in which uh, we're helping groups kind of ease back on how they have classified data risk level and are protecting it too much. Let's call this one the Snow Queen. <clears throat> so, once upon a time, there was a DA who took a little too much protection for the data entrusted to her care. She wasn't clear exactly on what data was very sensitive, very confidential, what data was regulated, what files could be shared freely. And so she built up a fortress around everything. And this caused much consternation and quests within her kingdom to try to access the data. Many trials to get access to the data that was needed any day. And the townspeople in her department felt that they were being frozen out. Uh, and so a new project came up to move from file shares that were in her network to SharePoint, OneDrive, Office 365, where files could be shared more easily. And so this DA met with the help desk 
to say what data is classified at what levels? How do I know what I can move to where? And unfortunately did not get clear guidance from the wise sages at the help desk. And so she came to the information security department. And I ventured forth up the hill to this frozen fortress to consult with her and her sidekicks about how to classify the data level, the risk level of the files in their care for what could be moved over. And I said to her, Elsa, why are you protecting these, things, these files so closely? These are minutes from your staff meetings. These are personnel files, but not with the regulated data, salary information, but this does not require the vaults and the towers and the locked chests that you think it does. Have you never seen, Elsa, our data classification table, which gives examples of what kind of files very, uh, meet the various levels and where, what systems you can store them in? And it's only the very highest rated that required the kind of lock and key, the dungeon that you're keeping your files in today. She said, Sandy. I have never seen this before. Why has this been hidden from me all this time? I said, Elsa, I don't know. It's out on scrolls on our website for all to read who just look for it. Perhaps you've never asked for it, but now we're here and you can see it. And so we were able to move forward with the file migration. Although Elsa confided in me, she said, Sandy, I've always strived to be the good DA. When I took this job years ago, people said, don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the DA you always have to be. Conceal, don't reveal. Don't let them know. Don't let files show. And I said, Elsa, let it go, let it go. These files are level three, not four. Let it go, let it go. Move to SharePoint and close that door. I respect what you did before. Let the files move on. We have multi-factor on SharePoint now. And yay, the kingdom rejoiced, the department rejoiced, and they were all able to move their files into SharePoint. And when the pandemic hit, and we all had to access our files from the variable distances, the internet got us there dependably. And so there was joy in Elsa's kingdom. So certainly people do try to um, protect files more than they need to. Uh, and oftentimes my team will go in and really try to convince them. And I'm sure you have this at Stanford as well, because I know you have a data classification table published on your website too, um, that there is not really all that much that needs people to secure, to lock down to such an extent that it makes access that difficult. And uh, you are now at... Um, passwordless access in many cases with your certificates. So making the kingdom very happy that they can get to their files. So let's move on to another story. Um, and the, the moral of this one is do the best with what you have. Uh, and for those who have seen the movie Master and Commander, uh, you know the joke there of you know, which one of these two weevils on the table looks more fit. Uh, and a, uh, an examination ensues and the, the doctor says, well, this one's clearly the larger one, healthier, I would choose a specimen. And Russell Crowe, whatever his character's name is, says, don't you know in the service, you always must choose the lesser of two weevils. 
So we're going to look at the lesser of two evils. And um, this story begins in a kingdom far, far away, literally a kingdom far, far away, a different country than us, uh, where we had people working internationally, uh, not on one of our networks, but on a shared network in a shared building. Uh, and we were called into consult to say, how are we going to secure the endpoints, the laptops that these people have, um, which are not even laptops that we've provided to them or that we manage through um, JAMP for SCCM, through one of those management uh, uh, platforms. Um, and so we knew they would be fighting off dragons and trolls and goblins and all kinds of halloween -y kind of things that would be on the internet and in the building and on that network. And so how were they going to have enough defense to put up the big fight? Uh, and so really our two choices were they could either have unmanaged laptops and we would have to depend on them to update them with the latest antivirus, anti-malware signatures um, to put on any CrowdStrike. Um, wasn't even sure if our um, license would extend that far to them. Uh, so we could go with that or we could go with a VDI, so a virtual desktop image. Um, but unfortunately, the licenses at the time we had were end of life. So they would not really be supported in future. So not a good choice either way, um, but we decided the lesser of two weevils would be put them on the end of life, DDI, uh, and frankly, now that pandemic has hit and everybody's working remotely, we've rolled out so many more virtual desktop image environment that we were able to get them uh, into a more current environment. Um, but no one thought that we would actually give them something end of life. All right. Not as riveting a story, I know no singing. All right. Our next is a quest for a secure room. Uh, in, in our consulting, we do consult with researchers, as Stanford will do in their research environment as well. Um, and Every once in a while, not often, but once in a while, we will have a research study come up that has such sensitive data in it that were it to be exposed, um, it could cause even death for some of the participants in it. Um, not the story I'll tell, but say if it's a study of how do incarcerated gang members managed to get illegal drugs from the outside in. Um, so clearly, if anyone knew that gang members in prison were talking to researchers about their, their method for getting drugs in, you know, they're gonna get beat up at least in prison, if not worse. Um, so that would be one that would likely have to stay off network uh, in a secure room. These are also the research projects. I look at them and say, do your parents know you're doing this? I'm like, oh my gosh, how scary. So this story uh, is about a mental health study of female refugees, some minors, um, as a result of their treatment in US immigrant detention camps. So you can imagine the first it's mental health. Now it's some are going to be minors, not 18 or over. Uh, and this is a US detention camp for immigrants. So there's going to be immigration status, ICE, Department of Homeland Security, you know, what kind of retribution for any of these people. Um, so it needed a secure room. Unfortunately, the group. Uh, doing this study, the, the researcher, we'll call her Cinderella, doing this uh, study, uh, their department did not have a secure room at their disposal. So from my team, 
the valiant Galakay said, Sandy, hold my wine. I will go on a quest for a secure location for this research. She got on her trusted two-wheeled steed and rode to the top of the castle on the hill, top of the hill to the castle where the research king dwelled. And she said, oh, research king, do you have any tower, keep, vaults where we could put this data securely? And he said, oh, no, all of ours are occupied already. I am sorry. Try the Queen's Council. So Kay went to the Queen's Council. Gallicay went to the Queen's Council. The Queen with her wise advisors, alchemists, and wizards who tried everything they could to transform the data into something less scary and dangerous that would need less confinement, but to no avail. It was going to stay dangerous to humankind and at least very scary. Galakay then journeyed him and Yan to all libraries to speak with the scribes of knowledge and seekers of truth. They could offer study cells, but their fortifications did not provide the strength to contain this potential plague. Their moats were narrow and dry, and the alligators were friendly. So off to the many fiefdoms within the kingdom went Galakay to speak with the sages, the school security officers. Perchance, do any of you have a locking chest where we could secure these valuables? Alack, no. Galakay then crossed the mighty river far and away into the southern realm of the kingdom, but could find no shelter for the data in the neighboring kingdom either. Riding home, Galakay came into the pop center where she spoke with Pandora. Pandora listened to her story and offered to keep the data safe in her locked box. She would serve as data steward and ensure the data would not escape into the world. Galakay returned triumphantly to our courtyard and told Cinderella, the researcher, I, I get hazy on these stories. Pandora would keep her data safe. As Cinderella ran up the steps toward us, the clock struck 12 and her principal investigator withdrew the protocol as the ball had already ended. The happy ending though, Cinderella did get her publication later uh, and Galakay finished her wine because I did not drink it while she was off on her quest. But my team will go always the extra mile to find that secure room for the secure research study um, and literally riding hidden down, <clears throat> speaking with all sages to see if there is any room at any inn anywhere. I think Galakay is still upset about that one. Uh, this next story pertains to some um, anxieties we had about moving some elections that we have at Harvard online. Um, I love the story of Bodie McBoatface. I'm not sure if everyone there out listening knows this story. So let me give you a, a quick recap of Bodie McBoatface, not a Harvard story. So in 2014, the UK government announced that funding for a new polar research vessel had been granted, yay. Um, the government decided to give taxpayers a little slice of ownership since their tax dollars were paying for this. So in March of 2016, the Natural Environment Research Council or NERC announced that members of the public were being asked for suggested names for this new expensive nautical marvel. Now the, the NERC did have a rough idea what might happen uh, with an open election with write-ins, 
uh, and announced that they would have the final say over naming the vote. So James Hand, a former BBC employee and public relations professional, um, put out on Twitter jokingly, suggesting the name Bony McBoatface, an homage to an owl named through a 2012 Adopt-A-Bird program who became an internet sensation, Owly McOwlface, so Bodie McBoatface. Within 24 hours, that name rocketed to the top spot in the poll. Um, and Bodie McBoatface fever swept the UK and the globe. James Hand even <laughs> went as far as apologizing to the Merck on Twitter uh, after his suggestion saying, I was just kidding. Um, so the poll closed, Bodie McBoatface uh, was the clear winner, receiving 33%, one third of the total vote, uh, and the second place only had 10% of the vote. Um, just as it said they would, Nurk said, no, we're not naming the boat, Bodie McBoatface. Um, instead, we're going to call the ship Sir David Attenborough after that famous researcher. So uh, there was a small consolation given, a submersible on the boat, um, the Dave, the Sir David Attenborough is called Bodie McCloak Face, but many of us still believe should have been the whole boat named that. So how does this matter to Harvard? Um, so Harvard every year has an election for the Board of Overseers. Um, the Board of Overseers is one of Harvard's two governing boards, and this particular board was founded in 1642. It predates the other governing board, which is the president and fellows of Harvard College, known more as the corporation. It's the oldest corporation in the Western Hemisphere. It was granted its charter in 1650 by the General Court of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. When the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was written and ratified in June 1780, it includes reference, a whole chapter in the Constitution, giving governing boards corporate status and land ownership and privileges to Harvard University in perpetuity, uh, actually named as the University at Cambridge in the Constitution, um, bestowing that on the President and Fellows Corporation, their successors, their officers and servants, respectively, forever. So our continuance of the two governing boards are actually required by the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and therefore kind of a big deal that we hold our elections. So the Board of Overseers uh, is a group of 30 overseers who are elected by Harvard alumni. They are Harvard alumni. Uh, and every year, five overseers are elected who will serve six years each. So. We rotate through every five years. Eligible voters for the Board of Overseers are all Harvard degree holders. So since I have a master's from Harvard, I get to vote uh, for them. And so, believe it or not, before 2018, 2019, we did not have online voting. We mailed out ballots to all Harvard alum uh, and got them returned by, by mail. Then they were fed into an optical machine that would read the votes and you know, count them and tally them electronically, but all the voting itself was done uh, by mail on paper. Uh, but with, with alumni all over the world, as Stanford has, you can imagine certain countries, the mail service might not be as dependable, so we really were not getting great returns from other countries. So this was from certain countries. So this was an opportunity to really expand voting, save on postage, um, but make it easier for alumni to vote too. So very timely for our elections going on now too. Um, I got to learn so much about elections and election security. And um, some of the questions people ask when you are moving something into cyber space, into digital space, um, their concerns kind of go beyond, well, what do you do in the paper-based world today, in the physical world today? 
Um, some of our concerns, <laughs> some of the concerns, suggestions we heard was, well, how are we going to authenticate that they're actually the Harvard alumni? And that's fine. We could um, just have them answer certain questions in this polling portal. You know, like, what year did you graduate? Um, just kind of demographic. Um, I'm Sandy Silk. I've got a master's from this school at this year. Like, okay, yep, yeah, you qualify. Just as when you go to a physical polling station, you at least when I go in Massachusetts, I tell them, here's my name, here's my address. They look me up, say, yep, you're registered, go vote. I vote secretly. And then I check out at the other side and they cross my name off on that side too. Uh, but somehow we the people considering this wanted to add more security because it was online. So could we have people log in with their Harvard key, which is very similar to, I'm not going to remember the name, the Stanford, whatever your certificate, whatever your one password is. Um, and then, you know, and maybe we could even brand the voting portal to be harvard.edu with the C name entry. So it is the third party, but it looks like it's Harvard too. So we can't let them, no, we can't give them the impression that Harvard is watching the election. You know, we need to go to a third party that's unbiased. Um, so we got over that hurdle. Um, this, some of the benefits though to moving online for voting are, we can look at what's the rate of votes coming in from any particular location um, where if you're just getting bags of mail during the day, you don't know the rate of mail coming in. Um, I learned all about electronic voting numbers that are assigned to people, the barcodes that go onto the ballots mailed to us um, that are unique to each individual and they contain not your personal information, but demographic. Um, you graduated from this school in this year. Uh, and so if someone tried to photocopy that a lot of times and cast many votes, suddenly there would be more people voting who got degrees in that area in that year than really existed. So you would know something's wrong. Same with the electronic votes. Um, my, my favorite question though, pertains to the writing ballot. Well, what if somebody writes in something like Bodie McBoatface? <laughs> well, unless Bodie McBoatface graduated class of 92 here, I don't think they're eligible to be on the board of overseers anyway. So this isn't an issue. Um, you Usually the candidates are all voted on by the Harvard Alumni Association ahead of time and put on the ballot. Um, and you would have to have quite a few voting with both face or whoever uh, write-ins. The great thing with the, um, the online voting though, is it could tell if you were trying to, because you get to choose like three or four. Um, you could elect three and then maybe do a write-in and it would know if you are trying to cast two votes for the same person because Sandy Silk was running and you also did a write-in of Sandy Silk. So it would just throw that away automatically um, at the time it was processed. So uh, very interesting, but certainly as you're looking at things moving from non-digital to digital, um, keep in mind, well, what are the safeties in place or not for for intended reasons in that not online area. And how do we copy that into the digital space? Because you know, if I thought I was logging in to Harvard and then Harvard is watching me vote, you know, the idea of a secret ballot is just gone in that situation. So uh, it, it was interesting to be telling members of the board of overseers who were uh, exploring this opportunity. And I did vote this year online and I was happy to have been a part of that whole process. Um, so as you look at projects or as we look at projects going into uh, a new digital area, 
you know, really you've got to look at what's the paradigm, what's the model coming with it and why does it need to be that way? So my last story, uh, and then we can open it up for your stories you want to share or questions. Um, uh, even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while, or um, I'm going to call it here, the ugly duckling. So this is a few years back. We were learning, uh, we were looking into integrating into our learning management system, uh, a service where students in computer science or any coding lab could submit their, their lab assignment. Uh, and rather than the teaching assistant, teaching fellow having to look through it and grade it manually, we could send it off to an automated third-party system to do this. So it was going to hook into the learning management system through learning technology interoperability, right? So like an AT API kind of thing. So they had, had already found the vendor they wanted to use. So my team, part of what we do is we look at vendors, we look at their security practices, the security of the product they have. How are we going to uh, keep confidential information, confidential right, contractual clauses, but also in practice? So at that point, um, we had set questions that we asked. Uh, and not naming names, but some of the responses we got back in this ugly duckling kind of scenario were um, the security architecture section states that the vendor relies on AWS, so Amazon Web Services, security tools and services to protect data from being compromised. There's no security training, but employees are expected to read the policy. Um, their own password complexity rules allow minimum length of only six characters, which didn't meet our requirement for complexity. They rely on AWS to provide security for the hosted application and really could not articulate specific configurations or requirements. Any initial responses to our questions just deferred to AWS. Um, RDS, AWS RDS was what they kept telling us. Um, they really didn't have segregation of production and development environments. Um, they were logging into their administrative accounts at AWS, not using virtual private network or two-factor authentication. Um, really no indications of any data or business resumption plan in place. Um, they did have encryption in place, so yay. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the gist of it all. So first thing we had to do was make sure no, you know, if we were really going to pursue this, because often it's nothing but opportunity. How do we make this work? Because this was going to relieve a lot of hours and time paid to TAs. So we said, all right, well, we're not sending any student personal information. It's going to have to be an opaque identifier between the systems. So it'll be just whatever identifier that we know ties back to the student and it goes with the homework assignment over there to be graded. So since they kept saying, AWS RDS said, hmm, let me do a Google search. And that is an AWS relational database service. Um, and it's an adapter for sanitizing SQL, SQL queries, among other things. So SQL injection is a big attack vector for web-based applications as code injection, but SQL is really known for it. So looking into kind of a standard contract for AWS RDS, uh, I found out that they were just were not taking advantage of virtual private network and two-factor authentication into AWS. It was provided in their contract. They just hadn't turned it on um, that this adapter was actually doing kind of web application firewall screening of the queries coming in. 
uh, and that it was taking care of authentication. It was essentially a gateway. So it was taking care of correct authentication and authorization, encryption. Um, so they actually were in better shape than they thought they were. And we could get them on the path there. So even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. While they might not have been able to talk up to their security, um, they had chosen a good service and at the right level um, that made this doable for the um, for the product that we wanted to use, the service we wanted to use. So we gave our report to um, our academic technology services group, and they said, oh, we really didn't want to use them because they're actually kind of expensive, and we were hoping that you would just come back and say, no, they can't that we can't use them. But all right, well, we'll tell them that they're too expensive and we're gonna go a different way. So uh, kind of ugly duckling, um, without naming names again, they did take our security suggestions into consideration, put a lot of them in place. And um, I've seen them winning awards for their innovative service, their innovative technology lately. So, um, hey, glad we could help you get a better product going. So at that point, I have some extra time left over so we can close out our book of stories for the time being and uh, just talk about, you know, if you have stories you want to share or questions for me or for others. I know others on the uh, moderating here are in the Stanford Information Security Group. Hi, Sandy. Uh, thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed your stories and I could relate to a lot of them too. Uh, we have a few questions uh, in the Q&A and I, I'm going to be your moderator for Q&A so I can uh, share some questions and uh, you can answer them. Um, so the first question is from Tad Perillo. Um, he says, your stories are fantastic. Can you tell us what is the biggest risk that your team manages at Harvard? The biggest risk for what managers? The biggest risk that your team manages at Harvard. Oh, wow, the biggest risk. You know, I would say that's got to depend on the day and what we're doing. Um, hot areas right now are going to be um, well, research. Um, and for those involved in the research area, you know the regulations are changing and it's not so much that the research data is becoming more sensitive, it's just the, the regulations are catching up to, re to research the way that they did in the financial services area years ago. Um, so that's just an ongoing battle there. I would say an emerging area is operational technology as we're building smart buildings. Um, and, and you know, Stanford is like a city as well. Um, you know, we've got water treatment plants, power generation plants, um, buildings with labs, even wet lab environments, where now we're going to have the systems that could release a toxic gas into a lab for a controlled experiment will be connected to the internet. So, you know, you've got life safety issues that, you know, if we just, if we looked at the systems just from the perspective of what data are in them, we wouldn't be worried about data breaches. Um, but, you know, you think of like the Russian, I think it was attributed, attack on the Ukraine power distribution plant, you know, just attacks on simple life safety um, systems could have a horrible impact on, imagine the media, I mean, you know, imagine the injuries and awful things that would happen to people, but the reputation would be just destroyed for the Ivy League University that had that happen. Yeah, I completely resonate with you on that. I think IoT security and smart systems is definitely a big risk area that we need to focus on. Okay, so I'll move to the next question, um, which is, uh, what drew you into information security career? 
<laughs> I never intended to be here. I never wanted anything to do with IT. I went into college as a biology major, uh, got a trip to Germany if I would declare a German major. And German is my family heritage. So I declared a German major. Um, went back years later to get my master's in that. And then I was working in financial services um, for a summertime just temp job between the master's and PhD. I was going to be a professor. Um, and so I was working at Fidelity for a female CIO of a systems group. And they just saw the potential for analytic skills. Don't underestimate language majors art majors, the analytic skills there, pattern recognition, rules, um, math, uh, and um, communications ability. And I had worked between the bachelor's and the master's. So I had some business experience too. And they just said, can you learn technology? I said, sure, I can learn technology. And then they just kept giving me such interesting things to do. And frankly, I was making more um, working this low-level job at a financial services company than I would ever make as an associate lecturer in Iowa or wherever I would be teaching, you know, medieval German. So, uh, yeah, never looked back after that. Thanks for sharing your story. I think it's a big message to everybody who's listening. You can be in any field and then come to security. It's just an amazing field to be in and there's always something new happening and it keep once you're in it it just keeps you in it forever yeah we say if you're going to work in it or information security then lifelong learning is your discipline because it just keeps changing so if you feel that you don't know anything today don't worry it's all going to change and we all have to learn the new thing so we all have imposter syndrome it many times is you're like, what do you mean we're not using that anymore? I finally learned that thing. Now it's a new thing. Definitely. Okay. Uh, so I'll move to the next question. Um, I love the storytelling nature of your talk. You talked about protecting research work, which you are aware of. What about a researcher putting data in the cloud? What is your strategy in terms of containing exposure through cloud platforms? Exposure to cloud, to cloud what? Or just to cloud shadow IT and the cloud kind of things that go on their own? Yeah, so researchers are putting like more data in the cloud. So what is your strategy at Harvard in terms of containing exposure through cloud? Yeah. cloud? So uh, as you know, probably at Stanford, although I think you may be even more um, strict or maybe people are more, I don't know. Academia doesn't seem to like to follow rules. So it, it seems to be you just have to give them the easy path. We call it like the fast pass. Well, you're in California. You know, you know about high occupancy vehicle lanes, the fast lane kind of thing when we all used to commute still. Um, we try to give that opportunity if they will go into the the platforms, the applications that we've already vetted and set up, we try to make the process as easy as possible to get into those. And then if they want to use something else, um, it's going to take a little longer for us to vet it. Uh, and beyond that, there is probably information out there we have no idea is you know being charged to someone's P card, corporate card, um, that or they're charging it back to the grant they just received, especially if it's not human subject data, so it didn't have to go through IRB kind of review as, as another shepherd. So it really is just try to make it easy to do the right thing so that people don't try to circumvent. Think of everybody as kids. You know, really, we just want to do it easily. <laughs> exactly right. Okay, uh, so on that, uh, kind of related to that, so how many data risk assessments does your team complete in a year? Can you tell us about a time you rejected a third party? <laughs> uh, so we have rejected a third party. Um, I would say right now, 
we are probably doing about 50 vendor risk assessments every year. And, and we outsource it to a third party at this point because it, it's a repeatable process for the vendor risk assessments. It's pretty much the same questions. I, I don't know if Stanford is using the Educause HECVAT, higher ed cloud, uh, something vendor uh, assessment tool, which is, you know, it's only like 200 questions that that you give to your vendors. But we we decided to outsource it because what we were paying per unit for someone else to do the assessment, then we receive it and we have to interpret it um, in relation to how we're going to use the system at Harvard and the configuration. Um, but it was cheaper for the hours. You know, if you're paying my team hourly rate versus outsourcing. So Vendor risk assessments are not so heavy for us as they used to be now that we're outsourcing. Um, and the research data security assessments, we really do just the high risk ones, but they tend to be a little more complex. Um, we're probably doing 80 of those a year. Um, so, and that's three people on my team who are in that space. The other two people on the team, we do the security awareness campaign. So if you've seen small actions, big difference. Oh. That came out of our office. Um, our security blanket came out of that office. Some fantastically creative people. We all like each other on to embarrass ourselves publicly whenever possible by singing or whatever. Um, and so those two are focused on kind of the community outreach and making things easy to interpret for the average person out there who's not a techno geek. Thank you, Sandy. So along the lines of risk, uh, the next question is, uh, what metrics do you use when you try to quantify risk? How do you normalize across domains? That is a tough one um, to normalize it across domains. Um, and I would say very much, probably as you, it's still kind of a, uh, yeah, it looks kind of this way. Um, certainly, data risk level is going to be a factor, as is the system risk level, right? If it controls environment or it's, you know, www.stanford.edu, um, you just don't want it defaced. If you want the data out, you don't want it to be corrupted or defaced. Um, so it's probably a critical system in that that's your face to the world. Um, so we look at is the system a core system? How much is going to be in it? What would, but also realistically, what would it take to do this attack on a system? What kind of skill level would the person need to have? Um, how tenacious would they have to be? Is it going to take five or six steps to do this? So they're really going to have to be dedicated to it. Um, and frankly, you know, I've got myself talking about threats now. Never underestimate just human error. We did like the S3 buckets in AWS suddenly become public facing instead of private. That is done very quickly um, because it's an insider account that just did something wrong, had no intent, you know, uh, and, it's, and it's done. It didn't take time and analysis and multiple steps. So, uh, so a lot of our consulting is going to look at business process too to say, what would someone try to get out of the system? How is that being protected? What are the kind of checks and balances to keep an error from my favorite error still looking back a few years? Do you all remember that? And, and you're on West Coast, so it probably had more impact for you. Hawaii was doing just the test of the emergency system there saying, oh, nuclear bombs have been launched and are approaching Hawaii now. And it was just a test message. I'm like. Oh my God, you know, something as widespread and sensational as that. Maybe you want someone to load it up and someone to review it and approve it before it goes out because that caused panic. Um, so, you know, it might not have a lot of money attached to it, but just the impact of doing something. Maybe you want separation of duties on those things. Yeah, okay. I didn't did not know of the Hawaii story, but it's an interesting one. I'll definitely read about it. Yeah, they should have had the little Microsoft paperclip pop up and say, it looks like you're trying to send a warning about nuclear attack coming. Are you sure you want to do this? Oh, no. 
Okay, yeah. And I think that's why like it's so important to have the education and awareness in place uh, for security controls. But again, to combat human error, it's important to have the auto uh, automatic controls as well to catch those. So I think you had done two very good points. Oh, anything you can automate, automate. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, so I think we can take one more question. Um, and that's also related to risk. Uh, does your team collaborate with the privacy office on assessing risk? How do you handle the different concerns from each side? <laughs> I'm laughing because we don't have a privacy office. We don't have that benefit that you do at Stanford. We also don't have a hospital. Um, we're of various Boston hospitals are affiliated with the medical school, the faculty, um, may work at those hospitals, but the hospitals are not part of Harvard officially. So we kind of dodged that HIPAA bullet. Um, we, we seem to be doing more and more in the privacy space. And that's, it's fine as long as we don't get pulled into the HIPAA space because that's very specific or PCI, you know, those regulated spaces. Um, but many of us uh, on the team now came from other industries, financial, medical, um, manufacturing, you know, so, so we bring with us a wealth of other perspectives, um, you know, intellectual property protection on development, um, um, but also Bramley Twiley, um, SOX, those kinds of regulations, we're familiar with them. So, and we all just want to protect people. I think there's that protector instinct for anybody who works in cybersecurity. Definitely. Okay, I think we can take one more question. Uh, we've got three minutes. Uh, observing the books on your desk, can you go over the ones that interest you the most and why? <laughs> See, I knew if I put books out because I was setting up for the storytelling that people would be like, what books are on her table there? Um, so I told you about my annotated brother's room, and it's even inscribed by my professor back then. My father-in-law got this for me through Amazon, found out who my professor was, sent it to her to have her sign it and send to me. So she says, you know, my memorable student of times past, mit Freundlichen Grüßen, Maria Tatar, um, 100 Years of Solitude. These are just stories I love. A Nervous Splendor, so turn of the century Vienna, turn the sample of Vienna. Stella Gibbons, Cold Comfort Farm, the movie is a riot. If you've never seen it, recommend it. The book is even better. Laugh out loud, funny. Canticle for Leibowitz. And I also picked The President and the Assassin because I love historical fiction, uh, not fiction, history and the science at the time for... Um, how do you get a bullet out of someone? How do you do air conditioning to this huge man? Um, and I like um, uh, detective stories too. So that's what's sitting here in front of me. <laughs>